Live from Vancouver, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Summit North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the OpenStack Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of OpenStack Summit 2018 here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host, John Troyer. Happy to welcome back to the program. It's been a couple of years, actually. Boris Rensky, who is the co-founder and CMO of Mirantis and also was on the keynote stage for the Open Dev part of, of this show here. Boris, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you guys and great to be back. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely. So, we're going to talk about Open Dev. We're going to talk about a few things, but let, let, let's start with Barantis, you, your company. Uh, you know, I, I think back to you know some of my first experiences at the OpenStack show. First of all, Barantis always does great keynotes. Remember, there's you know dancing on stage. There's uh, you know fun T-shirts. It's like I, I, I actually coveted. I don't go after swag much, but it was like you know the Heisenberg like 99.999% oh, right. pure T-shirt yes. um, yes. for uh, the Breaking Bad fans out there uh, to date myself on. on this, but um, always brings some some energy and excitement. And you know, Mirantis was a, you know like one of the companies really super glued to OpenStack. So bring us up to 2018. And when I think of Mirantis, what should I be thinking of? And uh, let's get into it from there. Yeah. So let me see. We are still super glued to OpenStack. Uh, we did go through some changes and some evolutions. I think, given uh, how long it's been since we've talked. The uh, notable changes have been uh, a change to our delivery approach and uh, with it some of the changes to actually uh, the underlying software stack. Uh, so you know, the most common thing is that you know, we've evolved Mirantis OpenStack into what we now call uh, Mirantis Cloud Platform. Uh, and the key difference is uh, how we approach actually uh, the uh, life cycle management of the uh, OpenStack itself. Uh, before, our tool for installing and basically updating OpenStack was Fuel, which was very kind of prescriptive and monolithic type of uh, uh, delivery method. And what we realized is most of the large customers that we have, they have a fairly kind of a heterogeneous reference architectures that you have to cater to, and you have to be able to do that in such a way that is cost effective. Um, so we've uh, rebuilt uh, Fuel for, to a new tool called Drivetrain, which uses a kind of a continuous delivery pattern to uh, um, manage and deliver updates to OpenStack. Um, and uh, with that, we've also kind of tweaked our delivery model a little bit. Before, we just followed traditional distro model where we just kind of like throw out our software out there. You can download it, play with it, and call us and we'll support you. Uh, when it comes to uh, complicated distributed systems like OpenStack uh, that are life cycled following a continuous delivery pattern, most of the companies simply don't have the in-house talent and skills to just take it and start deriving value. So we've uh, moved to what we refer to as a build operate transfer model, where we actually come in and we set up the environment or we manage an environment to an SLA, give a customer four nines SLA on the uptime of the OpenStack environment we're managing. And uh, after a period of a year, give the customer an opportunity to kind of gradually uh, take over the operations. And by operations, I mean like, you know, patches, updates, et cetera. Uh, until you know, after some time, we just completely um, we can completely go away, or we just take a role of the uh, um, like a software support vendor, effectively. So that's on the core business side. Yeah. Uh, since we haven't talked in a while, so it's a little bit of a long update. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, the uh, kind of uh, the thing that we've been talking a lot about recently has been the new thing we launched in beta um, about a month and a half ago. Uh, called Mirantis Application Platform. So Mirantis Cloud Platform is OpenStack as our core business. Mirantis Application Platform is a new thing that uh, we have launched about a month and a half ago that is based on Spinnaker. And Spinnaker um, is uh, this continuous delivery open source tool that's been built by uh, Netflix originally. Yeah, so before we get into kind of the open dev and the Spinnaker and all that stuff, one your viewpoint sure. on, on the OpenStack piece. So we sure. really appreciate that update. 
we, you know, there were years that we thought, you know, oh, it's the, the battle for like who's going to do distributions, and it, as you, you said, it's, it's just it's not that not that easy, um, yeah. and maybe we had, you know. Uh, kind of poor expectations as an industry as to where we could take it and where it should be used. So, uh, you know, how should people be thinking about OpenStack in general? Uh, can you give us, you know, one or two of the kind of the, the key use cases that you see in, in your customer base? Yeah, so I think that uh, what we realized is that when it comes to a kind of general purpose cloud, so to speak, um, there is not, tremendous value, at least among the customers that you know, we had the opportunity to interface with, uh, to use OpenStack. You have something that's already in place and you don't touch it, and that's usually a VMware, um, or you, know, um, you want something new general purpose, people go to public cloud. Uh, but there is an enormous opportunity uh, for what we uh, refer to as like tune stacks, or uh, clouds that are tuned to uh, particular kind of business use cases. And uh, this is where I think is an opportunity for OpenStack to excel, and this is historically where we, as Marantis, been actually you know, delivering value to our customers. So speaking of the use cases, um, our customer base is split into, you know, we split it into enterprise and telco. And uh, more than half of the customers actually are uh, from the telco side. Um, so, you know, telco clouds, there's a variety of use cases, and typically uh, those use cases are a function of the, uh, I mean, the overarching use case is NFV, virtual, you know, network function virtualization. Uh, but uh, the specificity and the reference architecture of the actual uh, infrastructure environment is a function of the uh, VNF that is running on that cloud. And uh, in some instances, you know, if you were to categorize the telco space, you can think of it in terms of uh, you know, kind of a big clouds for uh, VNFs that don't need to be close to the edge, and those that are kind of stretching out to the smaller footprint all the way to the edge. And those are vastly different reference architectures, and you do kind of different performance optimizations and tuning, um, and this is something that you can only do with uh, something like OpenStack. Um, now when it comes to the uh, enterprise side, um, the actual kind of emerging use case that we've been seeing quite a bit of is uh, HPC. Uh, because again, HPC is full of uh, kind of a purpose-built equipment. Um, you do networking differently, you do a lot of things differently. And uh, a lot of the times, just general purpose public clouds don't work for it. So for HPC, again, we have a, a set of reference architectures that are modeled within a drivetrain that you can just deploy fairly easily out of the box. Um, that caters specifically to the HPC use case in the enterprise. But, Bor yeah. Boris, do you think HPC then either includes now or evolves into ML and AI as well? Again, bespoke hardware, very specific uh, use case? Uh, yes, eventually, eventually. I, I think that uh, there is an opportunity there for some of the uh, actually uh, uh, kind of uh, reference architectures um, and deployment topologies currently used for HPC to evolve towards maybe some of the AI use cases. Um, again, I think that you know when it comes to enterprise and AI, um, you know it's it's a bit early. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Boris, you're, you're the tagline of the company is the managed open cloud company, and you talked about right. managing uh, right. being a managed cloud. That's been a fascinating development over the last few years. We're seeing it at the OpenStack level and for instance at the Kubernetes level as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, that approach and who are the yeah. who are the who are the customers that that need that that entry ramp or accelerator uh, for their for these private cloud installations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think that uh, there are two types of uh, um, ways to like implement infrastructure or implement the cloud. Um, there is those that are trying to, they're looking at public cloud and they're saying, okay, this is like, I see what Amazon's doing, what Google is doing is great, I want the same thing and I want it in house for security reasons, for you know, whatever, compliance reasons, doesn't matter. Um, so all of these guys that fall into this category, um, I think for them to become successful with the cloud on-prem, uh, 
should follow the managed approach. Again, I'm a little bit biased in this, and that like I'm selling well, that, this. That but was always the, the the hit against running your own private cloud is you didn't have the one did not have the expertise yeah, in house. Yeah, so that's exactly that's exactly correct. Like and that so first of all, the whole evolution between you know fuel to drive train and using the uh, uh, kind of the CD pattern to life cycling the infrastructure stack is something that. Uh, there isn't talent out there, there isn't DNA out there, and uh, um, enterprises simply are not able to just kind of go ahead and start doing it, right? Um, and uh, the whole model that, uh, you know, when you go to Amazon, you just, you know, have this cloud that is continuously updated for you, you don't have to worry about anything, right? So, um, this model implies that you focus on delivering the end service rather than delivering the software, right? When you go to Amazon, you don't get software. You don't get to pick and choose. You just get, you know, certain reference architecture that is delivered for you. Um, and uh, the guys that want to replicate the Amazon on-premise effectively, in my view, um, have to kind of be gradually on-ramped onto that. You can't just grab a software, do DIY, and expect you'll have an Amazon. There's a second category, and the second category is, uh, you know, like, basically like the software guys, the guys that, uh, you know, um, they, they, they are not looking for Amazon, they are really looking for cheaper VMware, right? Uh, which, is, which is a different experience, like, I have my own team, I have my ops guys, you know, VMware is great, but hey, it's too expensive, I don't want to be locked into it, give me something that's different. So, there is value in that, right, but this is not, kind of, uh, you know, this is not the segment of the market that we are going after, and I don't think that uh, kind of cheaper VMware is what most people refer to when they talk about cloud. Yeah. So, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Absolutely, so uh, you brought up Spinnaker before. Uh, yeah. Want to get your, your thoughts on kind of the things usually typically on top of, of OpenStack, but you know, Kubernetes, Spinnaker, uh, containers in general, uh, what, what's Marantis' position on this? What are you hearing uh, from your customers? And yeah, we'd love to tease out some of the Spinnaker stuff a bit more. Yeah, yeah. So Spinnaker thing is uh, fairly new for us. We've been tracking the space and Spinnaker in particular probably uh, for a year, although we've come out publicly just recently about it. Um, the reason why the space was interesting to us is because um, I think that everybody who is uh, undergoing kind of digital transformation and embracing cloud as a kind of a byproduct of it is uh, really after kind of, you know, being able to run the company like a startup, being able to release faster, being able to release more often. And in fact, when we'd come to our customers, our kind of, you know, opening pitch even for OpenStack has always been, um, you know, buy OpenStack, that'll help you build software faster. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's kind of like a cool pitch. On the other hand, I think everybody in the company, including myself, were kind of, you know, not entirely comfortable with making that leap. Like, okay, OpenStack means I can have, you know, an API for my VMs and maybe containers, release software faster, like how, how, do, you, how do you connect the two, right? So we decided to kind of, uh, um, in trying to solve this problem of helping companies release software faster, for once rid ourselves of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, kind of our existing business and kind of our kind of infrastructure centric views of the world and uh, kind of unpack the problem and see like what are the real uh, kind of, uh, you know, big issues with uh, uh, releasing software faster today. And uh, what we realized is that uh, um, one of the biggest bottlenecks is actually uh, uh, the continuous delivery part. Uh, because when it comes to continuous delivery, or even, you know, not to use fancy terms, just deploying anything to production in the enterprise, it's a very complicated process that requires coordination between multiple teams, like the application team, the SRE team, the SecOps team, all of these teams are using different tools, and uh, the handoff process and kind of the handshakes between are kind of very loose, generally. So, um, you know, a developer can build something very quickly, but for it to hit production environment and for, you know, the, uh, um, the enterprise to actually get feedback from the customers on this, it takes a very long time. So we started thinking about how do you actually, uh, you know, shorten that cycle, what, what can you do? And uh, with that kind of frame of mind, we've come across Spinnaker. 
And what we realized is that Spinnaker is actually, uh, in a sense, to uh, continuous delivery what OpenStack is to infrastructure. Because, uh, you know, the reason why OpenStack became popular is because it effectively, uh, you know, on one hand has all these plugins for diverse infrastructure, and on the other hand, you can automate the orchestration process of like bringing up a VM instead of having, you know, your, you know, server people come in, put in a server, your operating people come in, install operating system, then network people come in, configure the network, et cetera. It actually, you know, kind of built a workflow and orchestrated the whole thing automatically without necessarily requiring companies to like throw away their existing infrastructure investment. And uh, if you go to the CD space, the situation is kind of similar, right? You have all these different teams, um, you have all these different tools, and you need to find a way to automate and orchestrate this process so that you minimize the number of human steps. And this is exactly the problem space that Spinnaker's been tackling, right? So it's a kind of a core tenant is pluggability and having a single API for the entire CD chain. And the, uh, you know, the, the best implementation would be the one like you know, what Netflix has is where the uh, actual developers are able to just deploy to production directly. All of this orchestration between all the testing and all the stuff is done by Spinnaker behind the scenes. So we feel that actually tackling that problem uh, and bringing this innovation into the enterprise is going to be uh, um, you know, something very dramatic of producing an order of magnitude kind of a performance gains yep. for our customers. Of course, one of the things the foundation announced was the Zool uh, CI-CD. Can, yeah. can you help us reconcile Spinnaker and, uh, and Zool? Yeah, so Zool is, uh, from what you know, I would characterize it, primarily deals with uh, VCI side of the spectrum. So, and I mentioned this in my talk, so one of the things that we learned as a company is uh, um, you know, if you unpack CI, CD, which most people, at least in the infrastructure space, look at as like it's one thing. Like, oh, CI, CD thing, it's like one thing, basically. In reality, it's not one thing, it's completely separate things. Um, so, uh, CI primarily has to do with actually, you know, building the code into something that can be deployed, into some deployable artifact, and CD takes on from there. So, Zool deals primarily with CI part, and it deals with it in a, particular way for a set of specific use cases. So Zool emerged as the CI infrastructure for OpenStack project itself. And OpenStack is a very peculiar project in that you know, there's you know, thousands of developers with kind of different you know, uh, viewpoints on the world that are highly distributed, building many different components that are loosely coupled that all need to kind of come together somehow, right? So you need to have distributed CI systems that talk to each other and you can merge all of this code and test it all together, right? So um, that use case is very relevant for large open source projects and it's probably relevant for enterprises who want to adopt similar type of practices for software development internally, right? So if you want to some extent de-silo many distributed uh, dev teams that you have internally as an enterprise um, and overlay standard process for the CI piece of it for everybody, I think Zool is a good solution. And Spinnaker then comes after that kind of as additive that does the deployment part. Yeah, that's it. makes All sense. Right. So, so for us, unfortunately, we're running low on time. Uh, we're not going to have much time to dig into the open dev piece. La last question I actually wanted to ask you is, what do you say to the naysayers out there? There's, you know, the people that aren't here sometimes tend to throw stones at, you know, oh, you know, OpenStack failed, you know, OpenStack's dead, you know, all the VCs pulled out years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, Brantis has been, you know, through it, and you've got customers, you know, yeah. we, we've had a good experience this week. Um, yeah. But it, it's a different OpenStack than it was a few years ago, so just, you know, yeah, yeah. Give, give us the final word on that. Yeah, so, good question, I think that, uh, um, basically, you know, OpenStack was at this insane hype back in the day. Um, and um, it's natural to kind of expect that uh, the higher the hype, the bigger going to be the drop, right? But I think that all technologies ultimately, uh, they cannot sustain the hype. You have to uh, kind of, you know, level out at a, at a certain point that is, uh, you know, equal to the true customer value that you are delivering. So I think that the, uh, the naysaying is a function of, you know, just kind of very high hype that has now leveled to the, you know, um, kind of, you know, the kind of the, what it should be, 
really, uh, in terms of the uh, value being delivered by OpenStack. But, uh, and there's this pool, it generated this big pool of the naysayers that are walking around and saying it's dead. And the reason why there's the pool is because indeed there's a lot of investment, you know, there's enormous amount of startups that kind of, you know, like, ah, oh, we are the cool guys, we are, you know, going to change the world, we're going to kill Amazon, whatever, that now are completely gone, and now, of course, we are naysayers and saying that the whole thing's dead, but on the flip side of it, I mean, um, if you just walk around the summit, you can see that uh, there's many more users, there's many more customers that are actually talking about real use cases, and then uh, the companies that did stay and stick around, like ourselves, like Red Hat, like Canonical, and SUSE actually, um, are seeing continued kind of growth and increased usage. So just, you know, like a nice kind of closing comment is, uh, you know, our biggest customer for OpenStack is AT&T. We've been with them for um, five years now. And they've been like very excited about it, and then no, it's all going to be dead, it's going to be containers now, and then, but despite all of that, the usage is continuing to grow, and uh, um, there is 10,000 nodes plus now uh, running physical servers um, with OpenStack, and uh, it continues to work, and it just, you know, workloads are moving to it. And AT&T is not the only one. There is plenty more that are kind of following this trend. So, you know, it's a very lonely answer to your question, but uh, I mean, I remain optimistic. For us, it's still very much core of our business, and we're continuing to see growth and usage, and, uh, you know, we're sticking around and sticking to OpenStack. All right, well, Boris Rensky, as you know, one of our earlier taglines was uh, you know, helping to extract the signal from the noise. We appreciate you helping us to understand uh, the reality outside the hype. Uh, so uh, for John Troyer, I'm Stu Miniman. More coverage here from the OpenStack Summit 2018 in Vancouver. Thank you for watching theCUBE.